before we get started I'd like to go over a few housekeeping reminders if you'd like to comment we need to make sure that you fill out a comment card and give it to Laura Turway and then she will make sure that we get that so that we have a record of who you are if that's just for the audience not if you're one of the members and if you are a member and you would like to once I uh, open the discussion up for questions and you have a comment please tip your card up like this I'll keep my eye out and Karen and will help me to make sure that we try to get you in order but that way not everyone has access to the monitor and depending on what you're looking at on the monitor when you click to talk I might be looking at a different screen so it's easiest just to put the card up that way we're all on playing grounds any comment that is made needs to be made into a microphone so if you're in the audience please don't just say something because we need to make sure it gets recorded and when it's if you're speaking as one of the CIC members make sure that your microphone is on and that you're speaking into it I think that's what I wanted to go over just we will turn over to Barbara for the roll call Shelley Beatty present Mark Matheson here Linda Basinger present Dennis Anderson here Mike Mitchell here Amy Wilhite. Here. Joyce Gifford. Here. Jesse Buss. Here. Gordon Wilson. Here. Barbara Rankin. Stephen Haverbeck. Here. Karen Morey. Here. Bill McConnell. Gary Fergus. Here. Vern Johnson. Here. Georgia Reagan. Here. And Brian Boyce. All right. Do we want to welcome Christina now? Would you like to do that? <laughs> Laura? Sure. I am proud to announce Christina Robertson Gardner, who's a senior planner. She's been with the city for more than 15 years, and she will replace me with the administration of the meetings. You'll still have um, Katie Durfee helping with the cards and things like that, but you're in wonderful hands with Christina. She, <laughs> as all of us do, um, in value. Uh, public input and process and making sure that we have really good honest open communication two ways between the city and the citizens and Christina has ran more meetings than I could count with Planning Commission and Historic Review Board and you are um, you're getting a step up <laughs> oh. no. She's great. We we love you both. So <laughs> welcome aboard, Christina. Thank you. I look very very forward to being kind of your your project staff uh, liaison and hope to um, really support you in, in your mission. So okay, With that we will go to our presentations and welcome Amber Holvac. I've not seen you for ages and at this be meeting. Her for long. Uh oh. <laughs> what? <laughs> I'm not sure even how long it's been since I was last here. I don't even more than I don't a year. Know. I believe so. Well, um, greetings to those uh, that I, I guess I know and I don't yet know. I am Amber Holvick, director for the Oregon City Chamber of Commerce. I did used to serve on the CIC, so I appreciate what you all do um, to represent each of your particular areas in Oregon City. And uh, I am just, I'm here to give you an update on what the Oregon City Chamber of Commerce has been up to over the last gap in time since I've been here. And I'm afraid I'm probably going to be leaving some portions out, so bear with me. But um, Laura helped uh, distribute some items around to you. And so uh, I just tried to kind of narrow the, the pieces down to what I felt were the, the big ones. Uh, so just as a... I guess a frame of reference, um, I'm sure most of you are impacted by the winter weather, and I'm sure it, at one point or another it's probably been even a topic at a CIC meeting. And certainly our businesses were impacted um, both in the fourth quarter 2016 and the first quarter of, of 2017. Um, but just based on anecdotal evidence, chat, chatting with business owners, uh, it se seems as though most are turning the corner or have turned the corner. So that's a real positive. But just I encourage you to continue to support our local businesses as much as you can. Um, as a <coughs> housekeeping note, all community groups, including neighborhood associations, please, 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 
feel free to submit your events, whether it's a fundraiser, whether it's a get to know your neighbors, whether it's a street party, whether it's, a, and I'm sure you've gone through all the right permitting process. <laughs> so make sure you <laughs> dot those I's and cross those T's. But um, please feel free to submit those events to our calendar at OregonCity.org. It's always free for you to submit. And uh, you can easily find that. You just go to the, our home page, um, front page, down at the bottom lower right corner, and there's a little um, calendar. You just click on that, and that sends you right to the place that you enter your events. Um, also, how many of you are employers? Okay, <laughs> I may just skip that one. Okay, <laughs> well, please note your employers um, will be um, providing information to you very soon about the Oregon Saves program, and that will be rolled out to you again through your employer. And so, um, please just know that that's coming between now and the summer. Um, some employers will. Um, phase that in sooner than others um, but that is just a new opportunity for um, savings personal savings for retirement um, let's see so accomplishments uh, we have published our can't believe it 14th issue of Oregon City around town magazine and here was our cover this year and this gorgeous photo um, was provided by actually a staff member from Mount Hood Territory, um, Jared. Uh, da, 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 da. Let's see, can't quite remember his name. There he is, Jared Lyman, and um, it's just a great showcase of that wonderful thing that we find so. You know, it's one of our great unique um, characteristics for Oregon City, um, and we have gone back to just one. Uh, issue per year. Um, two were pretty hard for our businesses to manage from an advertising standpoint because all those advertisements have to um, cover the cost of the publication and there are 13,000 that are printed each year or in each issue. Um, moving on and yes I did bring quite a few um, <coughs> show and tell here. Um, one of the things that we're particularly proud of that we revealed earlier this year is the completion of our business emergency action plan. This is a, I'd like to say, a, a fairly um, user-friendly yet comprehensive um, toolkit for local businesses and actually employers, period, to prepare for anything from uh, let's see, the, the water pipes break upstairs and you have a wet mess in your office. How do you turn that around quickly, efficiently, without interrupting your business and getting right back to work? Or how do you prepare and deal with hazardous material spills? How do you prepare for that unfortunate, the car, um, unfortunately the, the car came through the front of your uh, office or store front and um, and that's happened here in Oregon City unfortunately and so this is a very useful um, tool for businesses and it's free and this was a grant um, the the funds were from a grant from the Oregon City Metro Enhancement Grant and um, this is also available for download at ocactionplan.com and it's our way of serving the business community and making sure, according to this um, quote, 90% of businesses who do not resume operations within five days of a disaster typically fail within one year and never reopen. So we want to make sure that that is not a statistic for Oregon City businesses. Uh, let's see, just completed our newly revamped annual fundraiser and awards event. And um, it was great fun at the Museum of the Oregon Territory. And I wanted to just give out a shout out to our award winners. Business of the Year, Oregon City Garbage, B&B Leasing. The Mike McCarroll Memorial Award, Dick Orr from BCT. Um, he is a gem in our community. Nonprofit Community Impact of the Year, Oregon City Women's Club. New Member of the Year, Hoodview Graphics. 
and volunteer of the year, Janet Mann of Janet Mann Nutrition Consulting. So um, we just <coughs> think very highly of all of these businesses and individuals, and every chance we get, we want to go ahead and share um, what um, the fact that they really are deserving of our attention and recognition. Next, uh, let's see, our chamber has been working very closely with the City of Oregon City and Clackamas Community College um, to champion the Beaver Creek employment area, putting education to work. Uh, it's very closely tied to the Industrial Technical Center, which is being um, uh, built at Clackamas Community College. And in fact, this Thursday, I'd like to invite you to the groundbreaking for that Industrial Technical Center. It will be on the campus <coughs> at 4 p.m. Thursday, April 6th. Um, let's see. And then one of the other pieces that uh, the chamber started last year are city walks, uh, essentially business city walks, where we split up into teams typically of two. And throughout the city in various neighborhoods or sections, um, we take two days in the spring and two days in the fall to knock on doors and say, how's business? How are things looking for you? Um, and this really allows them to um, share, I guess I like to call it the pulse of business, and for us to help either redirect them um, to resources that we know might be of service to them, but more so it gives us a sense of how are we doing here in Oregon City when it comes to business. Uh, let's see. now. I have a few of these available. In fact, I have four. Show of hands, who has heard of the Best of Oregon City 2017? Good, good, good. <laughs> gold stars, gold stars. <laughs> All right, good. So this is a brand new um, opportunity for Oregon City to really shine a spotlight and to kind of brag on our favorites. Uh, or the best of Oregon City in almost 60 categories. During the whole month of April, you are invited to vote online and nominate your favorite, for instance, your favorite sweet treat or brew or, let's see, under people and places, um, your favorite neighborhood gathering place. You all better submit your, your votes and nominations for that one. And you can see a whole host of um, categories on the back side of that first sheet. And so this is a super opportunity to really engage and to really start to elevate Oregon City to the place where um, we think we can be competing on more of a regional uh, horizon when it comes to some of our offerings and we want to start building it up locally so that we can really let the rest of the region know um, that we've got a lot of great things here right here in Oregon City so again best of Oregon City org click there you can vote and uh, there are other opportunities including the award ceremony which will be at Abernethy Center on June 22nd mark your calendars uh, like I said I have four posters here so the first four hands get to take them and post them somewhere <laughs> <laughs> well Steve thank you so much you have funny in my apartment mm -hmm. I'm sure you guys are just shy and you will pick them up at the end of the meeting um, also if you are a business or you have uh, you're part of a group or neighborhood or whatever um, you can also go onto that same website and download things like um, a logo for your Facebook page and you can go ahead and help direct people to say we want you to vote for us for the best like neighborhood spot or what whatever it is and so you can set that up and kind of cater it to what your um, needs and desires are Whew. Okay, and last but certainly not least, I also included um, a somewhat comprehensive calendar of events. Um, and actually, I started it with something that's actually in the past. Just recently, we had hosted 
a very successful Stay of the City address and luncheon on March 16th. Really appreciate the help of the City of Oregon City staff and of course our mayor um, presenting the address and a very inspirational video. Hopefully soon that will be ready for the rest of the world to consume. Um, it's, a, it's a great promotional piece for the city. So um, please use this as a guide for what's happening uh, here in the near future and into the summer. <sighs> and last but not least, the Chamber is your, locate, your um, source for relocation materials. So if you know people who are considering moving into Oregon City, please direct them to us. Um, we have relocation guides and can really easily uh, get them on the right track. And with that, do you have any questions? I have a question. I'll start it off. If anybody else have questions, put up here. Do you know uh, on the teddy bear parade, I know that you guys aren't actually in charge of that, nope. but do you know any more information about Oregon that? Oregon City Lions Club. Oregon City Lions. Mm -hmm. Okay. I had lots of questions about the route with the road closed. Well, the, so I and I, I haven't heard. Have they you know? reached out to Public Works? Awesome. Okay. I would defer to John Lewis. Okay, we'll defer to him during his time. <laughs> any questions for Amber? Do you have anything else to tell us, Amber? Karen has something she wants <laughs> you to say, Amber. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to if you are. More than likely, this is the last um, time that I will. Uh, sounds really funny when I say that. Um, that I will present a report to the CIC because my family and I will be moving back to my home in Roseburg, Oregon. So over the summer. Oh, no. Congratulations. So boo please, for us. Please <laughs> welcome, please, please welcome whomever um, the the next director is. Uh, I'm I'm certain that they will learn how important community is to this this city. Your little feet are leaving big shoes behind. <laughs> <laughs> yes. um, Thank you, Amber. Yes, with that. Thank you. All right. Oh, wait, I was leaving these. Okay. Thank Next you, up, Rockfall Mitigation <coughs> Tunnel Illumination. So, Caitlin, is that you? Okay, if you want to introduce yourself and your partner in crime there. And Amy. Yeah. Oh. 3532 Gonzaga at the half for anybody who cares. Thank you. We were, we were wondering you. about that. Wow. We'll be needing those updates. Yeah. <laughs> Can we put that on the big screen? <laughs> we need it. Too. Sorry, ladies. <laughs> Go ahead. Oh, you're waiting for you. <laughs> moment it was working right before this meeting started of course <laughs> do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself or is that on there That's okay fine. <laughs> my name is Caitlin Jackson and I'm the community affairs coordinator for our Oregon City our Oregon 99e Rockwell improvement project I'm Kelly Holly I am the project leader working on the Oregon 99e Rockwell project and so while she gets that going, uh, I wanted to apologize in advance for the familiar faces who's already sat through this presentation at the City Commission, but uh, I think it's good information and we're very pleased to be here today to share with you. And before we get going, as we move forward, please keep in mind that we're still pretty early in the process of design, so we don't yet have all of the answers for you, but we wanted to come well in advance to make sure you knew it was happening. All right, with that, I'll go ahead and get going. Feels like we're at a movie premiere coming <laughs> this summer. <laughs> it, on on it says it is. Jane, for you? Great. So we are currently in the design process for a project to increase the stability of the hillside and increase the safety of Oregon 99E in Oregon City. Construction is currently scheduled for summer 2018. So the stretch of hillside we are examining is from just south of the tunnel through Kanema Park. The three sections marked on the map there are the proposed project locations, 
However, as we uh, finish up design, one or more of the sections may be removed due to the availability of funding. The slopes in this stretch of hillside have a history of rock falls. I'm sure this isn't news to any of you who live in this area. This project will increase the safety of the highway by reducing the potential for rocks to impact the road. Rock falls are not only dangerous, but when they do happen and impact the road, it can take days and some time to clean off and reopen it for you. Since 2008, there have been eight rock fall incidences in this stretch. Uh, the wire mesh currently installed on the hillsides was installed as long ago as 1983 in one stretch. Some rock falls are minor and don't impact traffic, while others can close the highway or lanes of the highway for days at a time. Most recently, in November of 2016, a rock fall in the center section closed the northbound right lane for three days, and all of the lanes had to close periodically for cleanup. On this next slide, on the left is a massive boulder from a rock fall incident in 2015, and on the right, the rocks cover the highway from a rock fall incident in 2010. In 2010, both of the northbound lanes were closed for two days for cleanup, and the right lane was closed for an additional six days. Our geologists have determined that it'll be necessary to move or remove the wire mesh <coughs> and scale the hillsides. <coughs> Scaling removes the loose rock from the slopes. The slopes were last scaled when that wire mesh was installed, again as long ago as 1983. The contractor will then install any uh, rock bolts needed to help stabilize the hillside and then replace or repair the wire mesh. The contractor will also move any vegetation that is within 10 feet from the top of the cut slope that's in danger of falling into the roadway. Because the contractor will be physically scaling the hillside, they will need daylight work hours. To protect the traveling public and also to protect the contractor, a hard barrier will be in place between the work zone and traffic. This will put lane closures in place 24-7. Right now we are looking at one lane in each direction in that during the work zone. We are working to minimize the amount of time needed to do these repairs and also to minimize the traffic impacts, but we don't yet know how long each slope will take to secure. During work, travelers should expect delays or plan an alternate route. Our recommended detour for northbound through traffic would be to take I-5 North or to take Oregon 211 to 213 to bypass the work zone and connect with I-205. Pedestrians may encounter minor detours on the promenade walkway or in Old Kanema Park if the contractor needs to access the slope from above. If they do, we'll acquire the necessary permits. The work is scheduled to take place during summer 2018. At this time, we're in the process of identifying the key dates and high traffic events for your community, such as the Clackamas County Fair and the school schedule, and we'll attempt to accommodate these dates into our construction schedule. We are in the process now of setting up meetings with key stakeholders in your communities. We presented a couple weeks ago to the City Commission. We're here today and we will continue to set up those meetings. This includes informing your businesses. At the end of this presentation, if any neighborhoods would like additional information or an uh, individual presentation, please let me know and I'll be happy to set something up with you. We've been coordinating closely with the City with regard to their pipeline project, which I believe you'll hear about next, and our Rockfall project. And we've developed a project website and are currently in the process of developing an online open house. When we get closer to construction, we'll host an in-person open house. We'll, you'll see us at some community events this summer and next. And we'll also reach out to your residents through the Oregon City Trail news publication and mailings as needed. We'll also use social media and traffic advisories to help get the word out about the work next summer. In addition, we're exploring the use of variable message signs placed well in advance of the work zone to let travelers know about the construction. So while we are doing outreach, we welcome your suggestions on whom to reach out to. If there's someone that you think is important to talk to one-on-one, -on -one, we'd love that information. 
We also invite you and your communities to visit our website and sign up for our email newsletter and to stay in touch throughout the project if you have any questions. Please know our project website is up and running and I am happy to send you a direct link, but please note the links will all be changing as we unfortunately switch to a new website hosting platform. <laughs> So I can send out a new link when that happens. But my contact information listed on the fact sheet is correct and will remain so. While we're here, I wanted to take just a minute to remind you that this summer we're, we are repaving nine miles of I-205 from the Abernathy Bridge to I-5. We're also installing median barrier on sections of I-84 and I-205. And median barriers improve the safety of the highway by preventing by reducing the amount of head-on and crossover crashes. You may have noticed some work already happening for this project. And then in late 2018, we also have a tunnel illumination project planned for the pedestrian and vehicle tunnels uh, at Railroad Avenue, just north of the section, the first section for this project. So at this time, I would welcome any questions about Rockfall. <laughs> <laughs> you have a question about Rockfall, Mark? Um, yeah, but it's also part of the conversation that we had, thank you, we had on the council. Uh, Dan Holliday requested that you notify Canby because of his interest in, in Canby. Um, my question is, is the contract that you provided allocated funds to extend public notification beyond the city of Oregon City? Is that going to cost more money? No, our plan is to reach out to your community extensively, but also to notify the surrounding communities because the through traffic comes through this area and they'll need to know as well. So that is part of the contract the contractor has to pay for? Uh, we, myself, That's, I'm doing the from, outreach, okay. yes. Oh, out of your own pocket, great. No. <laughs> well, no, but it's in our budget <laughs> okay, to do outreach great. to surrounding so it's communities. it's part of the state budget, not necessarily part of the, of the uh, contract. It's not part of the contractor's funds, correct? Okay, that's great. So, Lynn, uh, go ahead. no, oh. if you have a question. Okay, Caitlin, Sorry. if you have a question. My card's up all the time. No. <laughs> Linda's first. Linda. Oh, okay. Um, I would like some extra handouts if you have any word from the Kanima neighborhood and you have section three and section two that go through the neighborhood. So, we'd like to pass these out and get these to our residents if you have some. I would be happy to. Is it, uh, can I email you a PDF? Would that work for you? Yeah. Okay. okay. Sure. Great. Okay. Okay. Karen? okay. I can't reach that far. Um, is South End going to be the designated alternative? We are exploring the use of South End, but at this time, no. It's not one of our recommended detours. Okay, because it's it, having its own issues right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it could become one, but at this time, no. Okay, so this talked about Rockfall. What about the part south of South End Road where the it was on the opposite side of the road that the right. pavement was slipping and they had to fix it? On Do South you know End? That? No, this no on 99, 99, back on to 99. Uh, the old Do you know what I'm talking about? They fixed, they, kind of, they fixed it a little bit. No, it wasn't a landslide. Part of the, well, it had to have been, I guess, a landslide. Part of the right lane heading south disappeared. Yeah. It, it's fixed. Yeah, it is. I just didn't know if that was a permanent fix or a temporary patch. That's I'm happy I'm to look into that for okay. you. Okay. Because we had some discussion about that at our last meeting and we didn't know. Disappeared highways are bad. Yeah, it was bad. <laughs> <laughs> Especially when you drove it in the dark before. <laughs> That's the right lane heading south? Correct. Mm -hmm. It's my understanding that, it's, that um, ODOT Engineering has reviewed that, put together a ge geologic um, repair made the repair and that's the fix as permanent as those fixes go oh okay so <laughs> it's, um, there's, no there's no guarantees sure. on these steep slopes. but that what they've so done is what needs to be done what they've done is permanent, <coughs> a permanent fix okay yes. I can that answers that for you yeah. okay great all right Mike you it may be too early in the design <coughs> process, but you mentioned possible trail impacts is that only during construction or is that after Construction's done also. That would only be during the construction if the um, construction crews needed to um, reach the slope from the top. Okay, but only during construction. Correct. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other questions? 
Great. Thank you so much for coming. We appreciate it. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Along those same lines, did you want to introduce, or do you want me to just go ahead? Go ahead. Just okay. introduce. Yeah. Dana? So we have um, Oregon City Bluff Waterline Replacement Project. John's mentioned it several times. This must be a more Scroll information. Roll the ball. Oh, yeah. Good shot of the it's pipe. A better presentation. <laughs> oh, John, <laughs> don't it's say you're so short. It's a beautiful <laughs> shot of the pipe. I love it. I don't know who was hanging off the wall to get that. Yeah. Good evening. I'm Dana Webb, a project engineer in the Public Works um, Department. I'm here tonight to provide um, a little bit of information about an upcoming project. The Highway 99E Bluff Waterline Replacement Project. Um, the waterline is attached to the Rock Bluff along Highway 99E just south of the tunnel. It's an approximately 90 foot long vertical pipe. So in December of 2013, the pipe experienced a small leak. Those leaks were repaired and the condition of the waterline has deteriorated. At this time, it's been determined that the pipe has reached the end of its useful life. <laughs> Additionally, during the winter, and especially this last winter with the freezing weather, um, operations staff has to spend quite a bit of an additional time um, ensuring the pipe doesn't experience another leak. Did you use the flex seal tape that you see the infomercial for? <laughs> 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 you have to climb up with it. So the replacement project um, will remove the existing 10-inch water line. As ODOT explained, we will um, also remove the slope mesh. We will, sim similar to their project, we'll scale the rock bluff around that water line. Um, additionally, if rock bolting is needed to attach large boulders back to the bluff, instead of removing them, we will do that, and then we will reinstall the slope mesh. This work allows the contractor to have a little bit safer work environment and ensure that there won't be small rocks um, or large rocks that fall during construction. While we have the pipe taken down, we will do a video inspection of the inside of the remaining water line that runs under Highway 99E um, to help us identify the condition of that pipe. Once that work is complete, we will reinstall a new 10-inch water line and reattach it to the rock bluff. And then during that time, we will maintain traffic control to create a safe environment, both for the contractor and the traveling public. So what that means is in order to provide a safe work environment, we will need to close two of the four lanes on 99E. So we will have one northbound lane and one southbound lane. Those lane closures will be for a period of up to 10 days, 24 hours a day. We will begin the closure on a Friday morning around 11 a.m. after the morning traffic. And the contractor's been given um, a, a window of time to complete this work, essentially um, after the Memorial Day weekend and before the 4th of July weekend. So with the requirement they start on a Friday, they've got three options for start dates. Um, the contract has been awarded to Wildish Standard Paving. We are um, getting started working with them, and at this point we haven't um, defined that closure window any smaller than those three start dates. There may be um, promenade impacts to the walkway above in the event the contractor needs to access the pipeline from above. So if those occur, we will um, create a safe, accessible route. The closure of two lanes on 99E requires a highway freight restriction notification, so essentially notification to large vehicles that they will not be able to utilize this corridor, and they will be rerouted, um, as ODOT mentioned, to either I-5 or the 213-211 corridor. Um, I've been working closely with ODOT to utilize their variable message signs on 205 southbound near Gladstone and 99E southbound at Dunes, and so we've worked out the messaging and the timing of those as well. Um, so this, it's, it's a really tough graphic to see, um, <laughs> and I don't have a pointer, 
Um, but essentially the lane closures for this will begin over near the arch bridge in order to um, safely transition traffic to one lane. Um, and then, so as you're traveling southbound um, at Main Street, we will limit the ability to make um, that left turn from 9090 southbound to Main Street. Um, then as you travel south, there'll be one lane each direction through the tunnel. They will be um, larger lanes to accommodate um, trucks that need to get through there. Um, and we've worked closely with ODA on that traffic control. You can see kind of in the middle of the area is the work zone. Um, and then we'll transition back to the two lanes up at South 2nd. Um, there'll also be restrictions for southbound left turns at Railroad Avenue. So part of our outreach um, is to um, share that the this pipe is a necessity to provide water to the mill pressure zone and also to provide fire flows to the downtown. The lane closures are essential to provide a safe environment for the contractor as well as the traveling public. Um, as I mentioned, the promenade may be impacted. Um, if it is, we will provide that safe and accessible access um, around the work zone. To limit the time needed to complete the work, the contractor will be allowed to work 24 hours a day on 99E. Um, if they need to work from the top, they will be limited to the standard 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. I don't anticipate they will do much night work just because of the safety um, in the corridor and the, and the need to bring in um, lighting to be able to do much. Um, I've started um, public outreach, so I've given the same presentation to the city commission. I'm here this evening. I'm reaching out to the downtown group. Um, I'm collecting a list of stakeholders and interested parties to provide email updates on um, timing of the project. There is a project webpage. We will utilize the city's social media accounts with Twitter and Facebook. We will create a project postcard for the impacted areas, a trail news article. We've been working closely with um, Caitlin and Kelly at ODOT regarding our projects as well as their projects. And then we will do press releases. Um, I have also reached out to um, Gladstone, Westland, and Canby and gotten the appropriate contacts with their groups um, to add to my stakeholder and interested parties list, as well as Canby Area Transit, as they have routes that go through here. Um, I'll reach out to um, the schools for school bus routes in the event that we start as early as June 2nd, I believe they're still in school. Um, reaching out to fire department, police departments, the, all the people that would need to know um, what, what we've got going on. And that's my presentation. Do you have any questions? So that was this summer, just mm -hmm. to clarify. OK. Because mm -hmm. we were here in 2018 as ODOT, so I had it mixed up. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> OK. Quick question. Mark? Um, the, well, a couple. Um, but first, I got to find out, is the water line only going to block the cast iron also? I, we don't have as built in McLaughlin. Under McLaughlin, the connection pipe that she's talking about. We suspect it is. So, do you have to avoid the last issue with the, like Lynn Avenue when you start digging Lynn Avenue and a hundred fifty thousand dollar contract all of a sudden would do two hundred and some odd thousand dollar contract? Um, do you is have any microphone? supplemental? Is your microphone on? You need to be. Sorry. Is you there any supplemental? Uh, any you need to supplemental Mark. Sorry, they need you to point, point it, it to, to your, your mouth. mouth a little more. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, is it, usually my voice carries, <laughs> so you know it's not an issue. Um, is there any supplemental plan in case you start digging and find out? Because old cast iron is the as an old school civil engineer myself, I've been in this situation where we found that we had to go forward and do another project to, to replace that line. I'm just saying you're, you're getting into a situation where you might be opening up a can of worms. So do you have any supplemental plans towards that? You want me to answer that or you want to I think it's probably your best. So the, um, the plans are not to do any excavation under this project. So they won't have a contractor that will have excavation equipment there. So the plan is to um, replace this pipeline to the 
only the exposed sections of it. So what our plan is after we essentially cut into that piece of pipeline is to insert a camera down through that pipeline right. to figure out what do we have there. Yes, if, but when you put mechanical mechanical fittings on the water line and you're doing a cast iron to new, there's usually typically a problem. So when you make that cut, unless you're doing it at a mechanical joint, you're not going to have a clean cut. My issue is that when you re-energize that line, you're going to bust something down the line. Yes. And I'm not just making. I'm just asking the question. It, there's you might run into a possibility. I would suggest that that might be the case when you get into it. Unless you're doing it above the grade. Yeah, we, we are doing it above the grade. So yeah. the intent is to have enough pipe there to be able to deal with that kind of a problem. Okay. And, you know, put most of the onerous on the contractor to make sure he's careful about that <laughs> piece. Um, yeah. But you're right. If, if we find with our TV inspection that we've got problems with that pipeline, which is quite possible, <laughs> then um, we're going to ha that'll be a whole new project. We won't do it as a change order. It'll be a completely new project that'll happen down the road. So you're safely that you can re-secure a new pipe to an old pipe without any problems? That's right. Okay. Yep. You said you had more than one question? That was probably it. Oh, okay. <laughs> Jesse? Thank you, John. Thanks, Amy. I have two questions. I don't know if that's on. <laughs> it seemed to be on the floor. Yeah. How's that? There we go. Okay. There we so go. So I do have two questions. Um, first, I don't know what scaling means in relation to this project. Could you explain what that means? So essentially, it would be similar to what ODOT explained. They'll pull back the mesh. Um, they'll go in and, and remove the loose, smaller rocks, um, the larger rocks that... Um, Sometimes you don't want to remove the larger ones for fear of other rocks coming loose, and so you'll bolt those to the bluff. So it's Thank essentially you. the loose rocks that would fall or could fall. Got it. I figured as much, but wasn't sure. <laughs> um, secondly, you mentioned a possible 24 hour workday for construction if working from 99E. As you know, the McLaughlin neighborhood abuts that, and we have a lot of members right along the bluff. So what kind of noise are we talking about in the middle of the night, which might impact uh, residents? Um, I, don't, I don't expect that there'll be much night work um, just because of the, the high volume of traffic and um, the fact that in order to do night work, they would need to bring in um, a light source. Um, but I, I think the thought is, is that the work that would occur down on 99E would be similar to what you would experience from road noise it might not be in the middle of the night but you're still there's a lot of daylight between what normal construction hours are you know i mean you're talking 5 a.m to 9 p.m feasibly so there's there could be that noise it's likely to be more of the things that might be traffic heavy that they especially when they're first setting up their traffic control trying to get their barriers in trying to get all their fall protection stuff in place those kind of things that are going to they probably would prefer to do that during this the least amount of traffic but i agree once they start doing some of the scaling trying to unbolt the rock fall protection cutting the pipe those kind of things that's not they're unlikely to do that in the middle of the night Okay. Any other? More. Gordon. Hi. So yeah, I had a question. Um, you were talking about working with ODOT, and ODOT was talking about working with you, but it sounds like there are different times, your projects. So I was just wondering what the overlap is or how are you working together with both projects? Three year apart. Um, so Caitlin and I have been coordinating um, both our stakeholder lists, our type of outreach. Um, sh they will have similar lane closures for their project so they're very interested in how the traffic um, <coughs> impacts are of our project to create lessons learned for mm -hmm. their project um, so i do have a couple of the odot traffic um, folks on my interested party list and they'll come out during the city's water line closure to understand um, what could work for both the tunnel illumination project as well as the rockfall project Okay, any other questions for Dana? Thank you. 
That was a nice presentation. Nice job. Yeah. That, that was, was a very nice, nice very presentation, nice. John. <laughs> I'm not. And meeting, you have to follow I'm that. Not meeting those standards. Ta-da! <laughs> Your turn. Dana's way better than me. We like you. Okay, so uh, real quickly, while the drawing, uh, the map's coming up, that we're going to show you the. Um, t just so you know, the Teddy Bear Parade. We've been working with um, the Lions Club and their volunteers to find a alternate route and at this point it looks like Main Street will continue to be the beginning location and it'll uh, head north on Main Street until you get to 14th and right now there's some discussion about 14th or 15th but we're pretty certain we want them to use 14th so they'll turn right on 14th and go two blocks to Washington Street and turn left on Washington and end up at the end of the Oregon Trail. Oh. So um, it's going to be a little more impactful because um, a lot of folks that can't use Main Street use Washington Street and so we've got some challenges there in doing that and it also affects some signalization that means coordination with Clackamas County. But um, the uh, Main Street Extension project is just not going very well. So, um, you know, they're they're projected to be at past the date of the um, Teddy Bear Parade. So the parade must go on. That's right. And, um, <laughs> we're working hard with them to make sure that happens. And um, same thing with the fair, right? So the fair. So there's a, some disappointment that the 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 not the fair, the Family Fun Center, and the parade don't you know, come together as one, as they usually do, but we'll, we'll work around that. <laughs> All right. Um, no murmuring from the crowd without a microphone. <laughs> yes, there's Continue only on. so many things we can ma manage around here. This little town is going to be um, like usual. We're going to be tearing things up a little bit, and... Um, <laughs> We, so um, I wonder if this will come in any smaller. Can you kind of? Seems like only half the city's showing. I wonder if we can uh, get I did it. This one's hard to see. Oh, that's kind of. So I'm sorry. Go back. Let's up. let's let's go there for now. So, by the way, this map is um, similar to what we've produced in years past. We'll be mailing it to every residence in Oregon City, along with a more better a better description of the kinds of projects that are shown on this. But this. This map depicts it, so uh, looking at the construction legend, if you will, for 2017, um, you're very familiar with the red lines. That, uh, that's our preventative maintenance projects, so slurry seal projects. And then our reconstruction projects mostly focuses on 15th Street. So we did all the water line work there last year. We're going to go back and take care of most of the pavement repairs on 15th Street. There are some other... Um, smaller streets on the project list. We had shown you a map earlier um, this year that had um, a few more projects shown on it, but after we've done more detailed cost estimating and come to the realization that we have some older utilities that we're a little afraid to pave over, we've narrowed the list <laughs> to, um, to uh, just a, a handful of streets. There's more on the on the bottom edge that all that we can, there you go. So, um, up in the uh, Rivercrest neighborhood and Warner Milne, um, up near Beaver Creek Road. And I think that's it for, yeah. Um, Slurry Seal, though, again, kind of scattered throughout. We're picking up a lot of those neighborhoods where, uh, for whatever reason, we missed uh, or the, the street edge, street age and condition really didn't warrant. But a lot of these neighborhoods in, with Slurry Seal work have already seen um, that kind of work before, so we're just kind of finishing some of those up. So scroll back up for me, would you, Laura? Sorry. Um, we also have some what we're calling in-house paving projects, and those are going to be anything from some of the narrow, you might see, you've seen these um, probably about a meter wide strip patches that have happened. We did quite a bit of it on, on Holmes Lane, uh, Malala. You know, we're just really going to try to keep up with some of that stopgap stuff that deals with some of the some of the um, uh, potholes and rutting that we've got going on around town. So that'll be our in-house paving crew, and um, 
then we've got our, our capital improvement projects. So they may be paving, or, but more likely they're, um, they're mostly utility related projects. So the South End water line replacement, um, again, it, Laura, if I could help get your help to scroll down just a little bit, or I guess I can do that, can't I? Um, so that's project number four, which is over off South End. There's a little piece of Warner Parrot as well that we're going to be doing. So that's a that's a pipe replacement project, one of those older pipelines, kind of similar to 99E, only not nearly as complicated. It's just an old um, problematic pipeline. Um, project, maybe I'll go out of order on these. Project eight, which is near, that's the uh, moratorium projects, and we're just now scoping that. We're commission supposed to authorize a consultant contract. We're going to break that into um, kind of an initial phase, better determine um, the full brunt of that project, and then come up, follow up with a more detailed design phase after that. Uh, again, kind of thinking a little bit ahead on um, you know what maybe that that pipeline for the Hazelwood neighborhood is actually right along Coffee Creek, so just above the Kanema neighborhood up on the hilltop up there. It runs parallel with that and in people's backyard, so we're trying to do some value engineering there to see what we can uh, avoid and not necessarily have to replace. Um, we've also uh, included some additional geotechnical work on that one because we don't want to run into the problem that we're running into on Lynn Avenue if we can avoid it. Um, Let's see, the other big project, the uh, Beaver Creek Road project, project number six, that's under construction today. Um, so we'll hopefully be done with that in a short amount of time because that shouldn't take too long. But if you've noticed, all the median trees are gone and most of the median's gone. I, haven't, I didn't see it today, but I'm guessing they made a lot of good progress on that today. And then um, project number nine is a sewer extension project. That's still in the design phase, but the idea there would be to extend a large trunk sewer along Beaver Creek Road and replace a lot of the private sewer that serves the high school with a new, um, I can't remember if it's 15 or 16 inch diameter sewer, but that will help to facilitate um, development out in that area and be able to serve, serve that area with, with uh, gravity sewer service. And then uh, project number seven, Lynn Avenue, we um, are also asking the city commission for a uh, change order with a different contractor. We're going to use the contractor that's doing the, the median on Beaver Creek Road because he's a more of a paving contractor as opposed to a pipeline contractor to go ahead and essentially pull out all the material that's there, patch that back, and then do a full width mill and pave so it'll be... It'll be a finished product when, when all said and done. We're still not going to be able to really implement the Lynn Avenue corridor plan, but we'll have smoother pavement, so it won't be uh, <laughs> as rough it is, as it is today. It's um, fun right now. Uh, we also hope to take on as an in-house in project the Holcomb Boulevard <coughs> slide. I think that's basically going to be recreating the slope up the, um, the side slope there along... Um, Holcomb Boulevard, just between really uh, 213 Bridge and Abernathy. So small project, but an important little project. And what did I miss? Um, Is there I something up there in Abernathy it. Landing? Just north? Up there. What's that, 10? Um, like so these are all projects. private development projects, and then we've shown them on the map before. Most of them have some form of street improvement, which may or may not impact your travels but um, and we also don't really have much control over the timing of those projects mm -hmm. so but they are in the queue they are making their way through the development process we we um, included them in the map uh, last year so we're gonna do, we've done the same thing um, this year just to kind of give you a heads up that those projects may start coming to fruition I guess the biggie is the Cove project and um, had a little debate in the office about whether or not we wanted to show the Main Street extension as a capital improvement project. It's really a developer-driven project, but it feels very much like a capital project because mm -hmm. they're doing some large diameter sewer work there, storm sewer work. They're building the roundabout. It's um, very much public infrastructure that's uh, driven by that project and their condition to build. So uh, it is, it's like capital, but it's um, development-driven. So we didn't 
we didn't highlight it any differently than just a development project. So that kind of wraps it up for what we're doing. Again, we're going to be sending this information in a in a mailer. So you have, have a there. timeline on that. Um, should have been yesterday, but uh, <laughs> we're working on it. Okay. But by the way, I'll mention this. Um, most of you know Kathy Griffin. So Kathy Griffin has retired effective uh, March 31st. So um, she's going to work back for a, uh, at least a month, but and she's going to help us through transition for a new administrative assistant in the department. But if you know Kathy, she's a tough one to replace, and so we'll just keep working through that. Um, but she, she'll she's going to kind of put the package together in the next couple days. So. All right, Mark, you have a question? Of course I have a question. Anyway, um, on number nine, the sewer extension, was that size for the new annex annexation? Yes. So before the annexation was approved, it was already sized to, it was probably a good deal. I mean, you know. We sized that when we did our master plan, which was done in 2012. <coughs> so when we did the sanitary sewer master plan, we laid out um, all the pipe configurations for the Beaver Creek concept area. Yeah. And pipe sizing as well. So that area is all included in our hydraulic model. So yeah, it's sized right. Oh, that's good. Um, the second question is on Barclay Hills of last year on the slurry sale, uh, do you have any options to get rid of the little rubber instead of instead of uh, using a lifting ring on your manholes, you know, elevation, you know, that little ring that goes on top of when you put a lift on the asphalt? Um, you, I've noticed you replaced them with, you've used rubber caps on top of manholes. Is there any opportunity to get rid of those and actually fix what you've got going there? So the ones that I know of, I don't know if the ones on Barkley, but on Malala. Yeah, I'm sorry, Malala. On Malala. Barkley Hills Neighborhood Association. Yeah. So on Malala, um, we put a, uh, my, my recollection is we About put an inch a, and a half. We, yeah. yeah, we put a thin lift on there. And I thought it was a micro seal that we put on there, but just enough to really kind of make those manholes that were already sitting a little bit low sit even lower right so the traveling vehicle was coming along and they're right in the wheel well and we were getting a lot of complaints about that right yeah i bet you would <laughs> so um rather than especially because malala for the most part is um channelized with medians and makes it very difficult to do any detouring around that we made the decision to just put on a it's a, for my recollect i haven't I haven't actually touched them, but I think they're HDPE. They're a hard plastic. Yeah, they're a hard and plastic. We, we bolted that down to the uh, manhole right. lid. It's made for that purpose, and the idea is to um, just live with that and not necessarily have to replace those manholes or go to the effort of trying to rebuild the manhole and raise it up to the right grade. Well, typically, you just take off the, the manhole cover and put the lift on it and go for it and seal it. So I don't understand why why it didn't get done in part of the contract that maybe this year's contract should add that into, you know, elevations should match. Typically, you know. um, they have one-inch risers. Right. Um, those one-inch risers on a high-traffic roadway like that, um, they'll shatter really quick. So they don't last very long. So um, two-inch risers, once you go to a two-inch riser, we get much better luck with them. But a one-inch riser doesn't quite do it. It's just not thick enough, not got enough meat to it. So the only option to really adjust those manholes is to dig around it, cut, fix it, cut them out, um, put the right size riser in it, rebuild all that, reset mm -hmm. it in concrete, and then right. pave it. So we just, we, we've made the decision to not do that. Well, it it's inconsistent I, i'm just saying it looks funky <laughs> it just looks funky to go down the road plus the slurry sale took about four months to 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 run it's already showing where it's already gone on malala so you can see the existing pavement was there so because that's a traffic malala gets a lot of traffic yeah i think uh, in the perfect world we'd like to mill off two inches and pay back two inches just like most sure. of our reconstruction work. We just didn't have the money to do it, Mark. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's always about money. Are there any other questions? Thanks, Mark. Okay. Thank you, John. All right, Trevor. We have proposed amendments to the Oregon City Municipal Code. Oh, this is a fun one. <laughs> For sheds, carports, membrane structures, and accessory structures. 
Yes. So yeah. I am pleased to announce the CIC, Trevor Martin, who is, um, so you have two of the five uh, planning department right here, um, but Trevor joined us from City of Yakima on October 31st, and he is our historic planner. And these are the, this is part of the other duties as a sign. <laughs> <laughs> that was fun caveat. Laura is learning to delegate. <laughs> you do this uh, on it, it'll change, but I will. Hello, my name is Trevor Martin, planner with the Oregon City Planning Division. And today I'm going to be talking, or this evening, I'm going to be talking a little bit about um, accessory buildings and membrane structures. Um, kind of catch anybody up who's not familiar with them and um, kind of talk about where we're going with this. So, jump right in. The planning division has been more or less tasked by the city commission to, to look at the accessory structure. Um, code in the Oregon City Municipal Code, in particular the membrane structure portion, and um, make the code more or less or more inclusive for proposed membrane structures in the future and existing membrane structures right, as of right now. And um, when I'm talking about membrane structures, this is um, what the Oregon City Municipal Code currently defines membrane structure as. It's I'm not going to read the whole thing, but more uh, tension metal or fabric that is attached to a rigid framework. So things like carports or th things along those lines is, are more or less what we're talking about. And that's what I have in the next slide. Um, we're looking at cardboard, or cardboard, carport, <laughs> cardboard, <laughs> cardboard, yeah. How's that hold up in that the rain? weather. <laughs> no, no, that's the rain. Um, <laughs> Carports with uh, you know, corrugated steel, um, maybe corrugated plastic, fabric, those types of materials that are supported either by um, posts, wood posts, metal posts, yeah, it can be riveted on, nailed on, um, tied on, those, that, that sort of fashion. Um, so I showed you the, the existing code, the proposed code would it's more or less the same for as far as definitions goes, but it's adding um, cargo containers to that definition and expanding the definition a little bit. We don't really have a, a good place for cargo containers, and I think this, this would make sense to include them in the uh, accessory structures um, update. As, as long as we're doing it, we might as well include it. So, just to clarify that one thing. So we don't, we prohibit metal, tensioned metal right now, which does include cargo containers and this proposal will allow metal structures. So there's a specific definition to not allow cargo containers, though we're allowing metal structures like the pictures you saw. Right. So it's, and then I'll explain a little bit more as we get into it, make our way into it. I think I need to go back, you go back one. So, and moving, moving on into the existing code. So this is kind of how it looks now. Um, there's a, a lot there. Our goal with these, it's not, they're not going to change much. Um, but our goal with some of the existing sections is to tidy it up a little bit and uh, make it more streamlined, make it so you can pick out the lines that you're looking for. One of the... Um, items that will be changing here is the height and uh, you might have noticed it in the previous slide but it said 14 feet this is proposed at a 17 feet we're still looking at that what's we're trying to look for a good height for people to accommodate their RVs but not to be too excessive so that's kind of what we're trying to balance out right now um, and moving on so the previous one with existing code was for accessory buildings that were 200 square feet and lower or under. Um, the next portion that we'd be looking at would be accessory buildings that are 200 to 600 square feet. And again, not much is changing here. We are, uh, again, streamlining it and, and looking at that height, that overall height of what's, what's a good balance, uh, 14 feet, 15 feet, 17 feet. 
whatever it may be. Um, and then building footprints 600 square feet um, and to 800 square feet. Um, this is, again, how it looks now. And the goal here would be to clean it up and um, just make it a little more streamlined, a little bit more easy for um, the public and people who are looking for that portion of code to read. So that would be the goal here. So as far as membrane um, or fabric covered storage areas go, so this would this kind of follows this in, su in succession of the code in um, 17, uh, 1754, I believe, 54010. Um, so the next we'd be looking at membrane uh, and mem membrane and fabric covered storage areas. Um, this is the way th the code exists right now, and our proposal would just be to remove it. Just remove the um, membrane. Uh, membrane and storage code and kind of incorporate the membrane structures into the existing accessory structures. So they would no longer be called out separately as membrane structure. They'd be looked at as an accessory building is what has how we would <coughs> look at them. Um, so and then we would add a section um, called prohi uh, prohibited, which would include uh, cargo containers and then membrane sh fabric structures that would be visible from the right of way. So that's kind of how we would go back and incorporate those um, cargo containers, is we would include ex uh, car like uh, items such as carports as a membrane structure, and then create a prohibited list which would um, include cargo containers. And the next item that we'd be looking at would be re to remove the seasonal sales section um, and add a temporary use um, and add a remove the remove the seasonal sales and add a temporary structures portion to the to the code. Um, the te we think this would be a, a better idea. I think um, when we're looking at seasonal sales, I think there may be, it may be a, a little gray and we might be starting to get into that section where we're looking at what are people selling when we, wouldn't sh when we shouldn't be looking at that. We should be looking at the use and how long that use is, being, is going on for. So we thought temporary structures um, made, made more sense and then this would allow um, businesses to do seasonal sales without kind of merging into that gray area. So as of right now, we'll be looking at permitted four times per year and up to 90 days in a calendar year, um, how, however businesses can work that out. And then we added a section for structures up to 2,000 square feet. Um, and those will more or less need to uh, comply with the dim dimensional standards, the existing dimensional standards of the zoning districts that they will be that they'll be in. Um, for structures, and again, more proposed um, structures larger than 2,000 square feet, um, kind of going off of what that was before, uh, should not be in a property for more than seven consecutive days, comply with the dimensional standards, and shall not disturb the ingress and egress of the site. So just to summarize, this would be like for fireworks or grocery outlet sale or whatever the thing is on, on non-single family or two family properties. And you get to do it four times a year. And the smaller the structure, so the 2,000 square foot breaks, less than 2,000, you get to have it for more. But if you're going to do like a giant outdoor event, then you could do that, but you can't have it there for more than seven days at a time. You only get four shots and it could be either be a smaller structure for a longer period of time or a bigger structure for a shorter period of time. Um, and then there's a total aggregate number. So um, does that sound pretty good? <laughs> Great. <laughs> so going on from there. So next we'd be looking at adding a and expanding a prohibited materials section and then this is where we would uh, again look at 
um, adding tarps because we've we've been looking at it, right now in the currently existing membrane structure definition, tarps is included in there, and there's this. It's, it's again it's kind of a gray area is what what does what qualifies what, what kind of tarp structure qualifies as a membrane structure or what kind of tarp design um, qualifies as a membrane structure and we thought we maybe clear that up a bit by adding tarps and just kind of eliminating that from the conversation as far as tarps being treated as an accessory building or, or a membrane structure so you're prohibiting tarps except for outside storage. Is that what you're saying? Right. So you can you can still cover your, your boat or your, your car. Yeah, or whatever. Right. We, we wouldn't want you to put up you know some fence posts and tie a tarp to it and have that as a membrane structure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that that's the idea behind that. Um, Again, um, special material standards, um, membrane or fabric fabric cover st storage areas are permitted as temporary structures, including the, excluding the t use of tarps. Do you define what a tarp is? I don't think we define what a tarp is, but that we might need to, need to tweak that a little bit as far and as well as cargo containers. We might need to tweak those those two areas and maybe add a definition or expand existing definitions just a little bit. <laughs> and so any questions and then one thing we're adding to that is we're moving around the hooved animals section of our code to the animals chapter yeah it was in the planning no, chapter that was interesting that we're not that changing the number or the requirement we're just putting it in the right spot good ideas <laughs> Gordon um, yeah I'm curious um, the examples you had, you can see those. Are those going to be illegal then? So, um, as long as so the currently existing um, membrane structures, such as carports, as long as they comply with the dimensional standards and they're behind the existing structures, the idea is to incorporate those structures. Is to basically grandfather those, those those structures into the city. Right now. Right so now, the visible from the where the part said visible from the adjacent the property lot or something yeah. like that. I mean, you right see that right. from the property line. So what? Right. How does that conflicting work? We don't allow this right now. This code change will allow this. We don't allow metal. And um, well, we're no. not talking about metal. We're just talking about the fact that you can see it from the adjacent property. Mm -hmm. I mean, doesn't it say that in the not allowed? Uh, it doesn't matter if you can see things from adjacent property. There was a, a thing that says uh, you can't have like um, fabric buildings, membrane structures, if they're visible from the adjacent right of way. If you could see it from the neighbor's yard, it doesn't matter. It matters if you could see it from the street. Can't you see that from the neighbor's yard though? See, there are two different things though. One right. is that we don't allow metal and we are allowing metal. And then the other thing, so this, you'll have more ability to do things like this on your own property. And the other thing is um, you're, you guys are keying in on a definition of membrane structures where we prohibit membrane structures, which used to include metal, but is now not. But it includes the fabric stuff and the pile of tarps that's called a structure. And um, that, um, we don't allow it if it's visible from the adjacent right of way. That still will be the case. But you allow these as long as they're metal. To be seen. Metal right still, away. yeah. So okay. we're not gear, right. we're not zeroing in on material anymore, except for those fabricy ones and tarps ones. So to answer your question, does the that tarps. Steve was next, then Jesse. Yeah, I don't want to ask. The something. other part of it is we're grandfathering all the existing ones. Okay, that's as what of I was January first. Okay. So but if they die, they die, and they, can they replace? It? Is it kind of like the sign code, or can they replace it with the same thing? Yeah, it would go under nonconforming. So if you die, you die. It's a, they're an intentional destru destruction piece under a nonconforming code. If you intentionally remove something, you can't put it back, um, but you can repair it while it's there. Right. Okay. All right, Steve. <laughs> so the um, existing ones <coughs> that don't comply with the setbacks, and they're still okay. So we would be. I mean. 
Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Good answer. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Provided yeah. they're not in front of the house. If they're in yeah. front of the house, not okay. Yeah. They still have to be <laughs> <sorry. laughs> grandfathering. It's, it's between the house and the road. The grandfathering applies to those next to the house and behind the house, not the ones in front. So if you have a metal structure in front of your home, you're never allowed to have it there. You still can't have it there. So, so the ones that are in the backyard and side yards, those, yeah, those, yeah. Yeah, those. <laughs> yeah so middle picture, okay, <laughs> but the one in front of your whole house, not okay. okay. Still not okay. Jesse? Thank you, can you hear me? More technical problems down there. And then Trevor, while he's uh, turning that on, can you talk about how this applies to the <coughs> historic districts? Oh yeah, so the the historic districts. I mean, the the historic code is still going to going to trump that. Um, so there, the the membrane, the accessory buildings that are proposed um, will still be reviewed by the HRB, um, and they'll still have to be meet design standards and meet the, co the context of those neighborhoods. And that was part of the code. It said depend, didn't that say something about current coding or current um, zones or whatever? Possibly. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Did you get that There's mic going, pages. Jesse? Lots of pages. Oh, all right. We Linda, Linda will share. <laughs> Thank you, Linda. Um, actually, I was going to ask about the historic districts, and now I just missed the answer because I was worried. Oh. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> um, so the historic districts, the historic, uh, the 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 design guidelines for those McLaughlin and Kinema are still going to apply. Um, so they'll still have to meet those standards set forth by the the design guidelines. Okay, so the district standards will preempt the yes, new. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Second question is: I was looking at the proposed change language specifically the grandfather provision, and it exempts um, those buildings um, from setback and, what was it, um, height requirements, but it doesn't mention the lot coverage requirements um, in that grandfather provision. So if there's a 40% maximum lot coverage for a lot, that's still going to apply even to pre-existing. Is that correct? So the... They're going to be, I guess, more or less grandfathered in, and they will they'll be legal non-conforming lots with possibly um, more lot coverage than is permitted. Um, okay, but that's not what the grandfather provision actually says, though. It, it specifically exempts it uh, from setback and height requirements. We'll take a look at it. One thing to note is that uh, the lot coverage doesn't comply to structures two, under 200 square feet. Right. That lower provision, so. So I think those are probably larger than 200, though, right? Well, uh, the one car ones are about 200, but yes, those ones are a little bit, so it depends which one, but we'll make sure we'll circle back on that. Okay, thanks. Okay. Karen? Actually, Laura answered my question. Oh, <laughs> there we go. Mark? Um, yeah, just for the record, I'm going to read 17.54.010, uh, which says Part B, residential accessory structures. The section applies to accessory structures within R10, R8, R6, R5, and R3.5. That means that commercial mixed use is not involved in this? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the second question I have is what are we going to deal with the last time this came up where we didn't grandfather we made a whole bunch of people get rid of their their structures and i have a feeling there might be some ramifications because this provision has a grant uh, a grandfather and if we remember the council meeting on we had a whole lot of people here on that item i have a feeling we're going to be bombarded neighborhoods are going to be bombarded by these questions you just made us you just made us remove our stuff, our membranes, our, our structures, because of the last code, and now we can do it again? I mean, some of these things are really expensive. So you, so how are we gonna handle this as a neighborhood association, CIC, whatever, or the city? I mean, it's gonna be complicated. Sure will be. Um, <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> okay gotcha. gotcha. <laughs> uh, it's right. the city commission direction. That, so in response to uh, some feedback regarding the inability to do metal structures in that enforcement piece, 
Um, they directed us to change the code, so that's what we're doing. And they directed us to change the code to grandfather in structures, whether they were built. Well, it's a good decision, or not, but there's going to be some. There's going to be some comments. Either way, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. That's your headache. Just Thank I'll just you. say no, talk to Laura. Like <laughs> or Dennis? Trevor. Or, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah. Dennis. My only question was, um, is this not covered in the permits that are granted for people to um, create a, I guess, a, a, a tarped garage or carport? Is this, does this help or assist people who would come to you and, and seek a permit to, a, to put up uh, some kind of like structure, metal or otherwise, or an attachment, or are, are we getting into an area where like, if, it, if it's already covered and, and specified in the permit, are we confusing the matter by going through this sort of like uh, grandfathering, grandfathering in existing structures and, and allowing new structures to have a permit? I'm, I'm kind of confused on like how this is gonna be uh, administrated. Uh, I think a goal of Mark, I think there might be more confusion in terms of, so I'm looking at three mm -hmm. pictures here, and um, we would all prefer it to be more attractive, I suppose, and, le and less uh, um, harmful for the, the viewing people driving by. But on the other hand, I don't see that too alarming, but uh, are, th are they satisfying a permit that allows them to put that structure up, or are they just doing this on their own and then hoping the best will happen that people just overlook it. I mean, so my, my question is, is like, are we complicating the matter by like creating a revised <coughs> version of like would be permissible when we're really talking about the, the general look of the neighborhood? Isn't this, I mean, I, I'm kind of lost here. Yeah, okay, so a couple different things. One is uh, you need permits if you're a certain height and a certain size, <coughs> that hasn't changed. All the ones that are in code enforcement um, I believe every single one does not have a permit. So we didn't permit something. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of um, coordination between building and planning. So if someone comes in for a building permit, planning's got to sign off first. Planning can't sign off on um, most of these metal structures because in most cases they're not allowed. So a lot of these ones sort of just sort of happened. Um, so the grandfathering <laughs> thing will not supersede any building requirements for a permit, so they'll still need a permit. Um, but regarding the general look of the neighborhood, I mean, you're, you're pretty right. We changed our code to say that in the city they don't want metal structures, and now we're um, changing our code to say actually it's okay. And um, that's a part of this public participation and um, a response from the city commission to a lot of comments from the public, right? Um, so it does work, and your voices are heard, and it's okay to take a code, and if you amend it over time, we amend code often. Yeah. So um, this is a response to amend the code, but you're right, it is an overall look for neighborhoods and what is okay for materials. Should we regulate that or not? And that body is the code enforcement? They're code enforcement is regulation, planning, building. We're all sort of part of this team. Okay. Thank you. Mark, you have another question? Just not a question, but a recommendation of using standard plans a standard plan format is to hand out to people. I mean, it. You know, this is. You know, this is basically the all this information in hand. The pictures are worth a thousand years. I think. I mean, thousand years, thousand <laughs> words, whatever. But the point of the matter is, is, is that you're providing a standard plan for these ideas that people can visualize, and anything deviates from that, there's a basis of conversation. Like they did for the sign code. Exactly. We have a how-to guide on our website. If you go to orcity.org, once you make it to the planning division homepage, there's a how-to I button on top, and it'll say accessory structures or whatever the thing is that you're looking for, and it'll give you a guide on, uh, to walk you through those code requirements that include building and planning. So we try to do one page or two pager for all of us together. So we'll update those two. Okay. Any other questions for Trevor? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Glad we got you sooner than later. <laughs> Okay, we have made it through the presentations. Did anyone have any public comments for items not on the agenda? None no. received. Okay. Uh, uh, a member uh, came to me, came to me that, and, oops, sorry. Uh, a member came to me um, and she saw something about the schools and uh, the water having 2%, 2% uh, of the schools have lead content. Um, I'm, I'm bringing up the, 
the I wanted to read it. Ah, crap. Put the wrong. There we go. Um, I'm sorry. Be patient. I'm getting it. But it was referring to a specific school that uh, there was a report. Actually, it's on the Oregon City. Oregon City website about the water quality in our schools and having um, traces of lead in it and they're still using bottled water and and such at our schools and she was concerned because she has children is there any kind of what's going on with that I mean if, is there anything I can direct her or help her out in understanding what the plan is to fix these these contaminated these lead service lines or is the lead service line is a service line in the main I don't think we have any lead pipes anymore, do we? Um, so what I know about this is a little bit, so yeah. I'll have to get back to you, but um, this came up for the city of Portland about a year ago, and it was big news in the city of Portland. Um, at that time, the city and the school district um, hired an independent testing company to test the facilities in the schools and uh, this is the part I don't remember. For the most part, there was no problems. I think there was maybe two locations where there was an indication of um, some contaminant that I believe was lead-related, so lead-related uh, fixtures. Um, in uh, we we seldom find any kind of lead pipeline or lead jointed pipelines. Definitely not on, on main lines, but uh, service lines as well. So, but there is, there have been structures that are old enough to have fixtures with lead in them, and that's usually where the schools need to go out and re replace those fixtures. But I, I guess I hadn't heard anything new about Oregon City Schools. So. The best contact would be the school. I do remember my son saying that they took out a few at Gardner Middle School and put in some of those new water fountains, and they disconnected several and said those weren't safe. But it, well, here yeah, it I found, like the, I found the email. It says nearly every Oregon City school district has has had at least one test result and exceeds the EPA mm -hmm. recommendation of of a point oh two threshold for a two millimeter sample draw for lead in the drinking water. One of those is Holcomb Elementary. So I would be happy to pass along contact information uh, to Mark for the school district okay. so we can connect the two. Yeah, I mean that's, I just have to have responsibility to reply. Yeah. Okay, Barbara, approval of the minutes. Did anyone have any changes or corrections to the minutes from last month? Yes. Dennis? Um, Wait, we let's get Barbara later, ready. Uh, with uh, Laura, <laughs> we, I think we need to address the, um, um, the meeting place of Kanema and also maybe the chair. It's been changed. Or we oh, talked about that. Agenda. That's not in the minutes. I know it's not about correct? the minutes, but it's just a small technicality. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're talking about a. Oh, on the agenda that where. Some, is that what you're talking about? Yes. The, the, the naming of uh, locations for uh, general meetings for Kanima and the um, new chair. In the agenda. Yes. yes. I will do that. Thank yes. you. Thank you. Small thing. That's okay. Anything on the agenda? All right. I'd entertain a motion. A minute, sorry. <laughs> entertain a motion to approve the minutes. So move moved. that we approve the minutes. Second. Oh, we're fighting over minutes. <laughs> yeah, All was, right. All right. This is an informal vote, so we just do it by the raise of hand. All in favor? Any opposed? Any abstains? Minutes are approved. And we move on to roundtable, and we will start at this end. Gordon, Jesse, combo team. Oh. <laughs> Thanks again. So I misspoke last month. I said that our meeting um, in April for the MA was going to be at the fire station. And I said that because I thought it was going to be just a steering committee meeting but it's actually turned into a hybrid steering slash general meeting, so it will be this Thursday at the library, not at the, um, not at the uh, fire station. And the agenda hasn't been finalized yet, um, but as far as neighborhood announcements, last month the, uh, at the general meeting, the MNA approved um, the submission of a historic landmark 
designation application form um, to the Historic Review Board uh, for buildings at the end of John Adams um, in the area that the neighborhood and the city are disputing the, the park status. Um, it look, turns out there are two buildings there from the t uh, World War II era, uh, the Camp Adair facilities down in Corvallis. So the HRB will be uh, reviewing and deciding hopefully on that application on April 25th, which is Tuesday at 6 p.m. if anyone's interested. Thank you. Okay, Linda? Uh, Dennis. Grab your mic. We have a general meeting on the uh, 20th of April. Um, we will be meeting at the police uh, uh, building, the police building up on the hill. That's Who's it. your new chair? And our new chair is uh, Tori Goodwin. Acting oh. chair. Acting chair. Okay. Okay, Mark. I'll pass it on to Shelley. Steve. Um, Park Place had a uh, steering committee meeting on March 20th and discussed a new subdivision that's going in and uh, also discuss the Sears annexation that is coming before the uh, City Commission this week. Uh, next meeting will be another steering committee meeting on April 17th. Okay. Barkley Hills Neighborhood next steering committee meeting is on April 11th next Tuesday at 7 p.m. at the community room at the cemetery and the public is welcome and then our general meeting is going to be May 9th also in the community room at 7 p.m. and not technically part of Barkley Hills neighborhood but the city um, the Rose Festival this year is focusing on history and plans to highlight Oregon City as a part of the history of the region and so they will be advertising as part of the Rose City festivities um, history weekend in Oregon City of June 23rd and 24th all the historic homes and the elevator and other great places are going to be highlighted as a part of that and we're going to be looking for lots of character actors to portray historical <coughs> figures from Oregon City in and around the city on those two days mm -hmm. so please encourage your people to get involved it's gonna be an exciting weekend mm -hmm. All right, Gary at our uh, at our last <coughs> meeting in March on the 16th I believe we had a uh, an extensive discussion with um, Commissioner O'Donnell and we talked about uh, Chapman Park and the flooding that's going on there and uh, Commissioner O'Donnell uh, wrote a letter to uh, the city and to the parks and that afternoon we had a fence put around the the playground area that floods because it's kind of a hazardous situation and um, it's my understanding that they're going to be uh, inst instigating or putting in some new drainage system so that hopefully that won't happen anymore. We'll see. Um, but we did get really good uh, response back <clears throat> from, from our discussion uh, through uh, Commissioner O'Donnell and then to the city and back through the parks and it got done immediately. And then the following Monday, we had also the concern of the of the swing set area which is also flooded which is also you know a foot deep of water and that got fenced also so this whole I th they're planning on and they've gotten contractors and I'm not sure if it's going to happen for sure when but they're going to they're going to drain the put in a new drain system around that area at the park so that we don't hopefully have that so anyway that that all happened because of the the neighborhood association working with the with the city and it, and it got done really well our next meeting is uh, may 18th and uh, Oni Konko will be our guest speaker at that meeting and he will be talking about whatever he talks about when he comes to our meeting <laughs> 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 i think i think goals. the city goals and that kind of stuff mm -hmm. thank you karen okay just in case anybody caught me laughing at the beginning of his comments one of the other things that helped it, the Chapin Park thing is like 20-year history of a problem up there. One of the neighbors blew up 
a rowboat and had her husband take a picture of her under the climbing gear <laughs> rowing. <laughs> and she feels that that helped convince the city that it really was a serious need. <laughs> so if you have a neighborhood problem, blow up a rowboat. No. Uh, okay, Rivercrest. <laughs> I did like the solution. Um, we have some changes coming. We have found a volunteer who's willing to be our secretary. However, Harris Gwynn has sold his house and it will be closing in late April. Mm -hmm. So we are working on a potential candidate for a new neighborhood chair. Um, it turns out it's someone Amy knows, so she's helping me. Um, so we have a steering committee meeting in May where hopefully we will be able to talk with a candidate or candidates for chair. And our next meeting is in June. And the Saturday before Mother's Day, I believe it's the first Saturday in May, maybe like April 30th or May 1st, um, it will be the annual Rivercrest flower basket sale. Um, come by Rivercrest Park where the picnic shelter is. We have gorgeous baskets for reasonable prices, and that's how we pay for our annual picnic. Great. How do you advertise that? Uh, mostly electronically, so it'll be on Facebook and next door. I'd love an invitation. Well, when you right. know the official date. All right, I will personally email certain people who ask me. <laughs> Gaffney Lane, I received an email, and I don't know if this came to all of the chairs or if it was the CIC or how I got it. It was from the Girl Scouts, so if they wanted to know about connecting with neighborhood associations, um, trying to coordinate projects or just getting the word out about Girl Scouts. If that's something your neighborhood's interested in and you would like a copy of that email, let me know. I can forward that to you. Our next meeting is, April, is this month, April 27th. We will have people there from the fire district updating us on the status of our the fire station. Oh, don't quote me. I think it's 16. That's by, Sounds right. uh, by Fred Meyer. So those are, they will be being torn down and rebuilt, so we're going to learn all about that. We have a, several land use things going on, but they were minor changes, so we're not too worried about that. But that's about what's happening in Gaffney Lane. Barbara? Mm -hmm. uh, Steve pretty much uh, brought us up to date. I, I just would add that with land use issues, you get a lot of people out at your meetings and we have several new people that have moved in recently in the last two or three years and they're interested in being active so it's really nice to have that support and uh, so we have I think four no six six new people that are going to be uh, running for the steering committee with the wow. ex existing ones yeah. Yeah. Exciting. Congratulations. Nice. Mike? Well, in the uh, continuing adventures of Caulfield Neighborhood Association <laughs> postcards, um, I mentioned the last time that they went out after the meeting. Um, this time they went out on time, but they went to the Kanima mailing list. Got one. Oh. Yeah, got one. Yeah. Did um, <laughs> so, so, and oh, the, the printing company did apologize for that, So, and I don't think we're going to be charged for it. Um, as a result of that, Wyatt Parno was going to speak, and as a result of that, that has been postponed. He was generous enough to come, he'll be coming back to our next meeting, which is May 23rd at 6.45 at the school district bus barn. And as Barbara was speaking, the game went final, Gonzaga 65, <laughs> North Carolina 71. Oh. oh. <laughs> One thing I forgot, John, since you're up next, I'll just throw it in. I was asked by Gaffney Lane to ask what the best way for us to, we have some concerns about the sidewalk and the location of the poles in between Ed Street and Gaffney Lane School. The telephone poles are right in the middle of the sidewalk. And so you can't, the kids can't ride their bikes, they can't push strollers, they can't do wheelchairs. I mean, there's no curb cut out anyway for ADA ramp, but the, especially right at, there's two, right at the edge of the school property and right by Ed Street that the poles are right in the middle of the sidewalk itself. So they want to know where we should bring that up at. Look at me. <laughs> oh, you were laughing. I thought maybe that was funny. I'm not finding it funny. No. Uh, so, uh, well, 
I'll make a note of that okay. because I don't remember Edge Street. I can't picture where Edge Street is, but um, it's toward it's I definitely away don't from know the school the towards <laughs> towards Fred Meyer, away from the school. It's the first. Okay. It's the only ah. street on that the school side of the of Gaffney Lane. Okay. Mm. Um, look into it. Thank you. Um, I forgot to mention. Uh, side, uh, South End Road, so we've got a lot of calls and concerns about South End Road, and um, this is the South End Road Hill, so between really South Second and basically the top of the hill, and there's been a lot of what we're calling grade changes along there, where um, sh what, we, uh, what we have always known and always seen there, um, so ever since I moved to Oregon City, there's always been these shallow set little slides that depending on the year, they kind of slough off, right? And a few years ago, the county did, so, oh, I guess the other point I'll make is that section of road, the city's never transferred jurisdiction. So we have a handful of those kind of streets that we haven't transferred the jurisdiction, mostly because we're a little bit worried about that hillside and the, uh, the cost to actually do um, a long-term fix for that. So the short-term fix is to continue to patch that back what I understand we're meeting with the county tomorrow to get a full update they've had a geotechnical engineer out there and I'm expecting to see that report tomorrow but um, what I heard over the phone was like what we've seen in the past are shallow set slides they um, aren't expected to be a catastrophic slide out but they're still problematic and uh, really what I've seen over the years with South End Road is if we can't keep the water on the inside edge of that roadway, it runs across the road and saturates that outside edge and that outside mm -hmm. edge gets saturated with water um, and it sloughs. So that's what we're dealing with. Um, we've all got ideas, the, the city and the county, um, but the county has indicated to me that they're expecting the fix to be um, um, uh, over a million dollar fix so um, I think uh, I think maybe there's even a longer term solution that we should be talking about and um, but it may not be I'm not a geotechnical engineer haven't even really um, done I've, I've been on that slope but not lately so it's a challenging slope um, no matter what we were to, would to do or, along there and I think if there was a even more robust fix it would obviously be more money and the question would be is given the importance to the city is it something that the city should participate in even if it's not our just our roadway so those are the kind of conversations those are serious long-term conversations there's also a short-term conversation about how to deal with it in a way that um, folks feel comfortable driving on it so we those reader boards out there electronic reader boards those are ours we've also um, talk to the county about um, reducing the speed limit along South End while it's in ill repair. It's not really the perfect time of year to try and get in there and repair those and I'm not sure they're ready to get in there just yet anyway because there still may be some more subsidence. So we'll find out a lot more tomorrow but um, the intent is to get the reader boards out there to r remind people to use caution while driving up and down South End Road and we'll probably post it with 25 mile an hour postings assuming the county approved that because they have the authority to be able to approve that kind of a change and I think we're on the hook for posting it so that's one little piece I just wanted to share um, I use South End Road every day we'll continue to I don't uh, I, I see it as um, uh, you know more of a blemish that we don't necessarily like to see but um, you know it, obviously if there were a more significant grade change um, if you're doing 25 you should be able to stop before you drive into it. <laughs> um, Boynton Reservoir, that's another project that you may have noticed. Um, we've got a high lift out there and we've been, um, we, we actually had to install some fall protection that meets current OSHA standards. We had a ladder to get up there and we had some railing to get out to the um, center of the Boynton Reservoir. Um, but beyond that, we really didn't have the right anchorage when they built that thing for today's requirements through OSHA. So we uh, hired a company to add some uh, hooks that were welded to the tank. Because of that, there's some problem that creates some problems with the um, 
surfacing on the inside of the tank. So that's part of the contribution for the um, <laughs> park puddles. Um, ah. It, did, we, it we, did close off part of the path. When we drain <laughs> Boynton Reservoir, um, we can't use all that water. We can't get it back in the system. We actually have to drain it by gravity. And the outfall of that is in Chapin Park. Ah. So when, <laughs> when we oh. open that, and <coughs> you know, really contributed. Right in the middle of the um, rain, Lake Chapin. Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, yeah, there was a bit of a river, I think. I don't know. I, I didn't get to see it, but I heard about it. I did. I, it was um, cool. So anyway, that's empty now. The idea is to pressure wash the outside and get the inside coated and re uh, the, the, the spots that were damaged by the welding, get those repaired and restored, and get it closed up and refilled. So um, that's going along well. I, I drive by that every day, too, but it's usually in the dark, so I haven't actually <laughs> seen them. Uh, and whether or not they've made much progress on the cleaning of that thing. So has anybody? Have, have I've any not seen them cleaning it yet. Okay. Okay. So they're they're still working on that. But Karen, anyway. I have a question for you, I, John. Because South End has those interesting emergency evacuation route signs on it, um, is there state money available to help with a bit better repair there? Um, Dream on. <laughs> Did you I wasn't going to say that. Um, I. I I would never say no, but um, I, you know, well, geez, highly this, unlikely. This, yeah, <laughs> highly unlikely. I think I there we go. That good. <laughs> That's a good term. Highly unlikely. Okay. But we'll keep talking that. That's talking a good that idea. In direction, because it does, it is a regional facility, um, but I mean, you can see from their rockfall protection project. I bet you they're not going to be able to afford to do more than maybe one of those areas. They said maybe yeah. one of them might be eliminated depending on what they really need to do I mean for us they're requiring they're not just I don't know what you ha what you what impression you had of rock anchors and rock anchors are like six feet long so mm -hmm. we drill back into the rock anchor the uh, you know set those bolts that's and the noise that <clears throat> you might have been asking about Jesse yeah it would be it would be a <laughs> little more um, yeah drilling and beating and a typical rock hammer kind of thing so yeah that that, that kind of works not cheap and I mean, and the other end of South End just took a beating between the landslide and the, I don't know if you saw the truck that jackknifed down there, but um, right in that, um, you know, as you're as you're at 9090 and South End, there's those cones, and uh, boy, the, a, a truck I don't know what exactly happened, but right in that location there took out all the guardrail along there and oh uh, went off the road. It was pretty impressive accident so wow. <laughs> yeah they got their hands full okay Laura <laughs> I I'm you're playing happy to present yes. our new land use <laughs> notice signs <laughs> they're the same blue <laughs> color <laughs> but they have more information um, and they're our city seal the city of Oregon City is actually on there so I think it'll be a lot easier to associate <coughs> it with the city project or with development or you know you'll at least know to call the city because you'll see our logo so they're a little bit um, they're plastic and so they're that corrugated plastic it's got a very technical name but they're yeah, about this tall and about this wide and we'll have the same great notices on there in the um, little sheet protector stapled on yep same thing so we laminate those notices with the map and then of the notice that we send out to the neighbors post it on there um, we couldn't be more excited they're going to um, stay up to that weather a lot better than our existing ones and um, they're a lot sturdier a little bit more expensive but we think that we can kind of reuse them a bit so um, please note that they are gonna look different and they are gonna look different as of on Friday when we use them for the first time because we ran out of the old sign. <laughs> so it's very timely, but um, they still have our phone number, they have our website. Again, um, if you have anything, just say, I saw a blue sign and that's all you need. You don't need to write down any file number or anything complicated. You can just go to the projects map on the website of orcity.org <coughs> and zoom in on the project, get to it by that, or just give us a call. Um, our phone number, website's on there, but or Google us. But um, we're here to help, so you don't have to get too detailed. Um, we can, we only have a few things going on at any given time, so we can connect you with that. And then also just a reminder that all of our applications are fully posted on our website, so the complete applicant submittal will be there. Um, 
So we're very excited for that. And thank you to Diliana Vasileva, who is one of our assistant planners, for um, making this happen. The other thing is that on April 5th, on Wednesday, the city commission, or the mayor, is expected to appoint Vern Johnson to our planning commission. And we welcome him to that. And then also to appoint Joyce Skifford as the primary for Hillendale here. And then also Roy Harris as the alternate for CIC as well. So we're very excited for that. Um, the last thing is um, I sent out an email that talked about Riverwalk parking and transportation. And I'm going to pass this over to Christina Robertson Gardner to tell you a little bit more about. Um, how we're going to address that and how we need your help. Thank you, Laura. Uh, parking, parking, parking. I think I get most, a, lot, a lot of people's questions about the Riverwalk relates to transportation. And as part of the Riverwalk design process, uh, the, oh, sorry, sorry. I'm zoom in. Okay. <laughs> uh, as part of the Riverwalk design process, uh, a parking and transportation plan is uh, being proposed that looks at phase one uh, parking and transportation access options as well as kind of you know we don't get a lot of chance as a city to really look holistically at an area so we're also looking at just general long-term strategy as we move through all the phases both public and private and I like to call it about you know all the tools in the toolbox and how and when and how best to use them uh, Rick Williams of Rick William Consulting, who did the 2009 downtown parking study and did an update this summer, has been contracted to help us put together this parking and transportation plan. And we're going to scroll down a little bit. Uh, the link to this website is a project page on the Willant Falls Legacy Project site at Rediscover the Falls. And if you uh, open the email from Laura, there's a link to this project page on that email. So I don't, I won't. Uh, cite you the URL, but it is um, just you see it's Riverwalk Parking Access Transportation Plan. Uh, we are looking at uh, putting together three, uh, we're calling them parking summits. This is not a traditional advisory board, but we want to have an opportunity to invite uh, stakeholders that are interested in learning about transportation plan and parking on site, and especially ensuring that um, kind of our large stakeholder organizations such as CIC, <laughs> the abutting neighborhoods, planning commission, city commission, chamber of commerce and such can commit to a member to go to all three of them, one person, and kind of be the liaison back to their organization to bring back information back and forth. Uh, because this is not an advisory group, everyone is, attended, is invited to attend, but we really are looking right now to see if we can get each organization to identify one person at a minimum who will commit to go to all three meetings and be that conduit of information back to the group. So you see the three meetings. The first one is this coming month in April 26th right here at City Hall. And it's uh, just talking about the background of best practices, the tools in the toolbox, initial community input. Meeting two is on May 24th. Uh, it uh, provides some uh, results of the outreach to date and the initial draft approach. And then uh, we're going to skip a month and come back in July 26 for the draft recommendations and implementation of next steps. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge that the exciting June 3rd preferred concept presentation at OMSI will happen kind of between meeting two and three. So I really like this layout. The first two meetings were really dialing in on the tools in the toolbox and kind of how they can be used both in this first phase and over time. Uh, and then we can come back in meeting three and kind of have that preferred design that we can look at um, and kind of compare that. The, um, a lot of the tools in those toolbox um, aren't necessarily always going to be implemented by just the city of Oregon City. There are going to be some items that the city and the project partners will commit to as part of the phase one. But looking at this strategically, and my goal is hopefully we can come back to this plan every year and kind of ask our partners at uh, DOCA downtown, a McLaughlin neighborhood, the city of Oregon City, any private development, what are things you are working on this year kind of in your work plan to help in the tools that you have control over. And so uh, I hopefully we can have this conversation um, in the long term and, and um, both think specific but also strategically. You want to scroll down, Laura? Oh, actually scroll up, sorry. So uh, the goals for the plan, I'm going to read these out because I think this is really, um, these are great that they were created. Uh, reach shared understanding among stakeholders of transportation, parking issues, tools, and goals. 
create a long-term metric-based strategy that can guide the community through the many phases of public and private development on site. Uh, achieve planning commission approval of the strategy and plan as part of the upcoming Riverwalk land use approval for the first phase. And identify always actionable <coughs> next steps. So we always do really well at creating documents, but I, uh, as part as a planner here for 15 years, I work really hard to make those actionable next steps so we can kind of revisit those every year and see where how we are doing and kind of put us all on notice that um, kind of together we'll, we'll it's going to take a village to figure this out and we all need to be working collaboratively when we can find tools that can work so um, I'm an actual next step kind of planner so I'm really working on that uh, so what Laura is looking for for this group and, and you can do this via email or have a conversation here is who from the CIC wants to not represent the CIC, but really be the conduit of information back and forth to the CIC about as these three meetings go forward. Similar to what Mike does for the Beaver Creek area, whatever that meeting group was. Is there someone here that would like to be that liaison that would like to volunteer? No one offhand? I can't have the conflict of interest. Okay. Yeah, I'll be gone in July, so I couldn't make I all three. Joyce. Volunteer over there. Joyce. All right, so Joyce, you volunteer. <laughs> I'm trying to push her. All right, so is it, does anybody have any objection to Joyce being a representative? Nope. Nope. Okay. Good girl. I volunteered. I Thank you very much. Thank you, Joyce. All right, anything else, Laura? Sorry. Okay. Commissioner Shaw? Uh, <clears throat> You know, with uh, Amber here tonight, uh, one thing I wanted to do was kind of recognize her, you know, for her work uh, with, the, with the city here. But it's kind of an emotional time for her right now. So I, yeah. when I left here, I went out and had a little discussion with her. And I, and I talked to her about um, having a, uh, you, you all are here to uh, maintain a healthy residential unit of this city her job was to maintain a healthy business side of this and there is quite a correlation there because we got the best of both worlds because we've got a really healthy residential unit here and we got a really healthy business climate now so we're very lucky to do that and I just wanted to reinforce that with her that she's made quite a contribution to that and as you folks have done here too so anyway that's all I got all right, Joyce. I'd like everybody to. Help. Is this on? <coughs> yes, it is. Yes, it is. It's on, so I'll just talk about her. Um, introduce Roy Harris. Roy um, will be appointed by the mayor to be the alternate for the CIC rep for Hillendale. So he will officially be on board with us next month. And um, I know that we're going to miss Faith, but. Um, we're glad to have Roy joining us. Hillendale had their last meeting um, on March 7th. Was was supposed to be a steering committee meeting at one of the local restaurants that had to move to our regular meeting spot at the church because we had three land use issues. As Barbara mentioned, if you have land use issues, people will come. <laughs> so we had um, over two dozen people attend that meeting. Um, the big one, of course, was Metro and what they plan on doing for Null Creek Canyon. And so they are not going to be continuing um, Beaver Lane and, and Otter Lane. They're not going to connect those two streets as some of the residents in our neighborhood had wished, but they're going to be putting in hammerhead turnarounds at the end of the streets so that the garbage trucks will be able to turn around at the end of the street and drive back down instead of beep, 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 backing all the way down, you know, at. 5.15 in the morning and not just, of course, you have the trash and you have the recycle and you have the glass and you have the <laughs> compost uh, yard. So, I mean, it's just, it gets pretty crazy in our neighborhood. But they'll be able to turn around instead of using Roy's driveway. Um, so that was, was pretty nice. Um, we are having our regular quarterly meeting tomorrow at Living Hope Church at 7 p.m. and the postcards did not go out. Um, so uh, the only way we can advertise is via electronically and word of mouth. Do you um, know what happened, Joyce? Uh, part of it was late on our part okay. of not getting the information to okay. Katie in time. 
Um, so we will we'll take responsibility, but I don't think that they made any expense of sending out postcards and sending them to the wrong place. We just, <laughs> but John Lewis is going to give us a quick update about what's going on with Public Works. And um, Christina, are you the other speaker at our meeting? I'm trying to. I think Kelly is. Kelly. Mm -hmm. Kelly. Okay. So Kelly is going to come and give um, an update on the Willamette Falls legacy project. So if anybody's interested, that will be tomorrow night, 7 p.m. at Living Hope Church. Yeah, <coughs> um, I want to re reiterate what Shelley said about the Heritage Day on June 23rd and 24th. We are going to be needing a lot of volunteers. And not just for that, we are also going to be having a mini float in the Rose Festival Parade. And so we'll be looking for volunteers to help with that. And that's early in June. So. Um, be watching your inbox for email from us about that. Um, Karen, I wanted to ask you at Rivercrest Park, have they installed the um, tiny le lending library yet? I haven't heard. I did hear, thank you, the PRAC for approving. Well, PRAC sent, uh, PRAC did approve it, um, but I didn't know if ours was the final recommendation, but um, I'd heard that, yeah, I think, so anyway, Prax said yes, that we would love to see that tiny library as long as it was manned by somebody in the Oregon City Women's Oregon, Club. It's part, yeah, the Oregon City Women's Club is Women's Club is going to sponsor in. that one. So be watching for those tiny libraries. Some people are just putting them in their front yards. We have several in our neighborhood. There's one next to Gaffney that's really well done. Mm -hmm. um, other stuff going on. Um, the Parks Foundation is planning an ivy pool at Waterboard Park. So check the Parks, Oregon City Parks Foundation website for information regarding that and how you could volunteer and help with that. The city is working with Solve and they're having another volunteer cleanup day. And that's on what day, John? I couldn't find yep. it on the city website on my little tiny phone here. April 29th. April 29th? That okay, so that's before our next meeting. Um, April 22nd, they're having the shred day at um, the police department. So make sure that you take care of yourself. And as of yesterday, all of your cans and bottles are now worth 10 cents when you recycle them. And you can drop in for parks. Oregon City Parks Foundation, um, there's actually when, if you go and, and take your cans and bottles there, if you would like to donate to the Parks Foundation, when you check in your stub, one of the things that you can click on is to donate to the Parks Foundation and the money just would come directly to us. Or we can get you a bag that has one of our stickers on it that you can just take up there and you don't have to stand there and, and put the cans in individually. You just drop the bag off and all of that money would come to the Parks Foundation. So if you're interested in helping out the Parks Foundation, which is interested in helping the parks here in Oregon City, um, fund some of the, um, not just the, the maintenance things, but you know additional park benches. We're looking at um, possibly some p helping with play structures down at the end of the Oregon Trail Interpretive Center. Um, so it's going to a good cause. We are a nonprofit, so donate your money and right. hope to see some of you tomorrow night at the Hillendale Tower Vista Neighborhood Association meeting. Uh, we're basically uh, doing a joint meeting with uh, Hillendale at this time, so Tower Vista will we'll be there and see who shows up on uh, without any mailing notice, kind of like uh, Mike has gone through there, the way it sounds. Uh, other than that, show up and we'll see what goes on. Thank okay. you. Um, I did have one last thing before we close. The Two Rivers neighborhood, we haven't had a member here at the CIC for quite some time. I was wondering if there was a neighborhood nearby that might be interested in reaching out to Brian to see if they would like to co-host their meetings. And Okay. So, Steve, could you report yeah, back? Yeah, Park Place will reach out to Brian. Okay. No, no, because just invite them to do a joint meeting like you do yeah. with Tower Vista. So if you could just report back. Steve? 
could you just re would you report back on that yes. okay and All right. you'll also start to see um, and the next work product for CIC will be creating that guide to help support other neighborhood associations and chairs great okay all right with that we are adjourned <laughs>